You know, I don't really get upset about Oscar snubs anymore because, I mean, it's the Oscars, but I was a little sad to hear that Sean Baker's The Florida Project didn't make the cut for Best Picture this year. Because I think when it comes to the Academy Awards, the nominations really matter more than who the eventual winner is. It's always silly to pick the best anything when it comes to art. But with the nominations, at least the 7,000 members of the Academy get a chance to highlight a field of diverse, transformative films. If the Oscars won't highlight The Florida Project, then I'm happy to, because it's without a doubt one of the best films of 2017. And watching it, for me, was one of those transporting experiences that I only get a few times a year, if at all. The story is about a group of kids and their parents who live in a budget motel outside of Disney World in Florida. The people who live in this community are on the economic margins, not quite homeless, but not quite able to keep a permanent roof over their heads either. The struggles of living in this kind of poverty give the film an undertone of sadness, but the genius of The Florida Project is that it tells its story from the perspective of the children who can't help but see their world as a playground. Baker is pulling heavily from Hal Roach's Little Rascals, a classic series of comedy short films from the 20s and 30s that was groundbreaking in the way that it showed kids as, well, kids trying to capture the nuances of their behavior and energy in a naturalistic way. Like the Florida Project, Rascals was set against economic hardship, the Great Depression. These kids, too, were growing up in poverty, but the focus was never on that. It was on the scrappy optimism of childhood. Now, the Florida Project has deeper ambitions than Rascals, but that optimism, the brightness of this point of view, is everything. It keeps the subject matter from being too overwhelming, something that can shut down our ability to empathize and sympathize. Sean Baker, I think, understands something really critical about storytelling, that we don't absorb things by looking directly at them. Often, we see more clearly through indirect means. There's a lot that Baker and co-writer Chris Burgosh want to say about the hidden homeless in America, but they don't just come right out and say it or show it. The reality of these troubled lives exists in the peripheral vision of a child's day. Baker and his cinematographer Alexis Zabe keep the camera low. Parents are often framed peanut style, just a bunch of legs. Even when the kids aren't around, they favor low angles so that adults tower over the frames. And through the course of the film, you remember what it's like to see the world from such a low angle. You remember how big everything seemed and how much sky there actually is. Carefully building this perspective pays off in a scene like this, where you have a key piece of information about these people's lives, which is that they struggle so much to make their bills that they need the assistance of a local church food bank. Baker plays this scene again from young Mooney's perspective, and we have to piece together what's really happening here. He doesn't want to show us the food assistance itself. He wants to show us how normal something like that is to Mooney. That's the devastating thing. In fact, all of the film's most crushing moments are played from the perspective of kids. When Mooney's mother starts prostituting herself to make rent, this is the way that the Florida Project shows us. Oh. Hey, there's a kid in here. I told you the bathroom was off limits. This is out. Put the curtain on. Is there a kid in here? Out. Moon, I'll be right back, okay? This is how the film talks to us. Something is always seen through something else. The decaying edgelands outside Disney World are seen through the colorful imagination of an adventurous kid. The promise of Disney World is seen through the poverty that surrounds it. The pain of living without work is seen through the kindness of neighbors and strangers and motel managers. And Mooney and her mother, Haley, the film's two main characters, are seen through each other. In some ways, Haley is a loving, caring mother. In others, she's a delinquent, selfish mother. These are all things that we see and learn through the way that Mooney acts. Give us a break, lady! In Haley, we see a Mooney that was, a child that grew out of her innocence. And we also see a Mooney that might be. I failed as a mother, Mooney. You disgraced me. Yeah, Mom, you're disgraced. 
It's in the continuum of these two that the film finds a way to express truths that are larger than the movie itself. For those living in the margins of late capitalism, tossed around by the wave of the Great Recession, Mooney and Haley are representative of a cycle of hardship that can lock itself into a family tree for decades. Mothers like Haley bear some of the responsibility for the situation, but we bear some of the responsibility too, because as the film shows us, mothers like Haley are really just kids like Mooney, and Mooney is nothing but innocent. It's a way of understanding the individual and societal responsibilities for poverty that only a film can achieve, and only a film with this kind of discipline. Now, this doesn't mean that the Florida Project is trying to Trojan horse a sad story to the viewer. It's an incredibly joyous movie. It's fun to watch, like The Little Rascals. And the particular heartbreak we feel doesn't and can't exist without that joy. Baker couldn't express one without expressing the other, because he understands that they're part of the same thing. That's the kind of understanding, and this is the kind of filmmaking Academy members should promote through their nominations. It's a shame they didn't, but I guess I shouldn't mind about snubs, because, I mean, it's the Oscars. Let's go beat it up! Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for watching. This episode was brought to you by Verve. If you don't know, Verve is a service that, that pulls together a lot of great content channels like Rooster Teeth, Mondo, Crunchyroll, Funimation to watch all in one place. So you can see some of the best anime there, definitely, but they've also added a lot of new channels like Mubi, which hosts a rotating roster of 30 indie movies, which is something that I love. One other show that I would personally like to recommend is The Director's Chair, where director Robert Rodriguez interviews other directors like Coppola, George Miller, Guillermo del Toro. I've been looking for somewhere to watch these episodes for so long, so I'm thrilled that Verve has it now. You can only watch that with Verve Premium, which gives you ad-free access to everything, all 13 channels. And for a limited time, you can use the first link in the description to get a 30-day free trial of Verve, so definitely try that out. Oh, and they have offline mode now too, so you can watch all that awesome stuff on the go without an internet connection, which is pretty cool. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you next time.